Trapped, Cash Bell in America shines a light on our deeply flawed criminal justice system and the activists working to reform it. This documentary explores the growing movement to end the inherent economic and racial inequalities of cash bail while highlighting victims impacted by an unjust system, the tireless campaigners fighting for criminal justice reform, and the bail industry lobbying to maintain the status quo. Trapped, Cash Bail in America is produced and written by Chris L. Jenkins and edited and directed by Garrett Hubbard. Americans are incarcerated before even being convicted of a crime, all because they can't afford to post bail. How did we get here? Chris Jenkins is an award-winning journalist, independent filmmaker, and political strategist. Over his 20-year career, he has told stories about social justice, identity, and progressive culture with the focus on race, class, and equality. The Chicago Defender had a chance to speak with Mr. Jenkins about his new film, Trapped, Cash Bail in America, streaming on YouTube Originals. So this film I thought was extremely um, informative and showed a very human side of what what this does to American families, particularly in black and brown and poor communities. So for those that may be unaware, can you talk about what the current um, problems are with our current bail system as it is? So uh, thanks for that question. Really great to be with you here this morning. Uh, it's a great starter question because it really helps sort of frame uh, what I think is a real a human rights viol series of job violations that happen every day in the criminal justice system. And that's simply that there are hundreds of thousands of people um, every night who spend time in jail only because they uh, cannot afford their bail. Um, and essentially what that means is that um, they are arrested um, and are uh, brought before a judge, and the judge asks them if they can um, you know, produce the amount of money necessary to uh, get out of jail so they can fight their case. Um, and generally speaking, these are nonviolent uh, misdemeanors or low-level felonies um, where these hundreds of thousands of people every night are in jail for. Um, and so what we're talking about are bond amounts from anywhere as low as $500 to $5,000 that people cannot pay um, and essentially what we call that in sort of the criminal justice uh, reform movement um, is wealth-based detention. So the only reason why they're in jail is because they can't pay. It's not because they're bail amounts. It's not because uh, they are a danger uh, to society, uh, the crimes that they have committed um, or, alleged, or, or they're accused of committed um, are not crimes that um, would, when would consider um, making this person a danger to society. And these are people also who do not pose a flight risk. Uh, the main purpose of bail uh, in American judicial, judicial system is to ensure that people come back to court. That's essentially it. And so what we are finding across the country, as I said, to the tune of 100, 000, hundreds of thousands of people every night, are people who are stuck in jail only because they can't pay their bail amounts. And it has really tragic circumstances uh, uh, impacts on uh, not only their families, but their ability to be able uh, to continue their lives while they fight their case. Um, and I'm sure your, uh, your viewers in the, um, of the program understand, of course, that people are innocent before they are proven guilty. So these are people who are criminal, who are uh, statutorily innocent before um, they've even come to have their trial. And they're essentially being incarcerated uh, because they can't pay their bail amounts. Now, who did determines these bail, these bail amounts? So bail, bail is a very, very, very complicated um, practice because it is essentially um, legislated or organized uh, in each individual community, each individual state around the country. So there is no, for example, federal um, one way in which bail um, is handled uh, around this country. But generally speaking, um, there are two ways in which bail uh, are, are set. Either there are a schedule of bail um, amounts that a judge must follow. So, so the state or the local community has said, for this kind of crime, this must be the bail amount. Uh, for that kind of crime, that amount of money for bail uh, for the person to, uh, to get out of jail. Um, or, or sometimes judges have discretion um, and listen to prosecutors. 
um, who um, are setting a bail amount very often uh, because they want to get the criminal justice machine turning. And so one of the things that uh, critics of bail have found is that prosecutors set bail at arbitrarily high amounts so that um, the uh, alleged criminal um, has to plea out or it has to negotiate um, their ability to be out of, to get out of jail or to um, plead to their particular uh, offense or alleged offense. So for example, um, very often people, um, and usually in black and brown communities, um, are given bail amounts that are um, 50%, sometimes 100% higher than uh, white folks um, uh, charged with the same crime. Uh, very often it's prosecutors who are doing this. And very often what that means is if you're giving a high uh, bail amount, you don't want to stay in jail for six months uh, trying to fight your case because you've got all these sorts of things going on in your life outside of jail, losing your job. If you have kids, very often going into foster care, losing your housing, um, losing the ability to be able to go to school, lose your place at a homeless shelter. All these sorts of things happen when um, you are unable to pay your bail amounts. And very often what happens is that people um, plead out or plead guilty in order to get out of jail. And sometimes uh, those uh, the quote-unquote punishments for those fractions that they have been alleged to be um, guilty of um, are very, very you know, low prison times. We're talking, you know, five, five months, a year, that sort of thing. And so people are, generally speaking, pleading out in order to get out of jail before they've even gotten a chance to fight their cases. I noticed that with the young lady in the film where she was really uh, toying with the idea of just pleading out so she could get out and get back right. home to her son. Right. What I didn't really realize until watching this film was how much of a big business bail is. Um, and there are a lot of people who are living quite nicely as a result of of our bail system. Um, what has been, I, I was glad you actually put that information in the film for perspective, but I, I really had no idea how much money is being made um, negotiating, you know, people's, their bail or their time, you know, the amount of time that they spend behind bars. Can you speak to that? Sure thing. So indeed, it is an issue uh, regarding uh, the bail system, but it's generally speaking, criminal justice system and is, you know, a money machine, a, a, a dollar producing uh, industry for lots and lots and lots of very wealthy people in this country. Mm -hmm. As it relates to bail specifically, there are a number of different ways in which uh, there are big businesses involved um, in the caging of people before they've um, <laughs> come to a, um, even become, before they've uh, come to trial. Um, the most obvious way and the way in which we highlight in the film is the bail bond industry. Yeah. Um, and just for your viewers who aren't familiar with bail bonds, you know, bail bonds essentially are, is an industry in which um, a, uh, a bail bondsman will uh, bail out um, someone who's been accused of a crime um, and let them go free um, in order to, to fight their case. But in order to, um, for that freedom, they have to pay the bail bondsman a non-refundable fee in order to uh, fight their case from the outside. Um, so even if you make all your cases, uh, all your court appointments, even if you uh, are found not guilty, even if the case is dropped, uh, if you've initially paid that bail bondsman, you lose your money. So that's one of the ways in which, um, you know, folks who have been critical of the bail industry essentially have, um, you know, targeted as essentially, like, these are people essentially who are preying off of the circumstances of the poor, even no matter what happens to them during their individual yeah. cases. Um, but it may sound like at $500 to $1,000 a pop, it may not sound a lot of money, like a lot of money, but the bail bond industry made $2.5 billion in 2016 over these kinds of transactions. $2.5 billion with a B, the entire industry around the country made around this kind of interchange of paying, of being, of charging fees for people to get out of jail uh, while they fight their cases. 
Um, and so, and very often, as you can imagine, it is a huge industry that is backed by, uh, by insurance surety companies. So in order to secure that bond, each bail bondsman needs to be backed by an insurance company, which, as you can imagine, is making, again, billions of dollars off of these individual transactions because we arrest and jail so many people in this country. Yeah. Um, you know, one statistic that I always uh, use in conversations like this is that we spend in this country $14 billion to jail people who have not been convicted of a crime yet. These are people who are pre-trial. $36 million a day, $14 billion a year, we spend just jailing people who are in jail pre-trial. So think about that. Think about, and so, you know, I know there's a conversation around the funding the police and all these other things. And the question becomes, I'm sure there's a robust conversation to be had about defunding various different portions of the criminal justice system. But mm -hmm. I think part of the conversation that many advocates are having is $14 billion a year to jail somebody, uh, to jail people who have not been formally convicted of a crime. That money can be used in so many different areas um, to prevent uh, violence in our communities, to um, for social service program, for education. I mean, there are so many things that $14 billion can do. So, um, but the main issue, I mean, so it's all part of this huge system um, where everybody somehow is making money off of uh, these folks who are in jail pre-trial, mm -hmm. not having been convicted of a crime. Just think about all the, 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 billion, the billions of dollars that are flowing through this system. <laughs> So one other way that um, the financial incentive is incredibly destructive to uh, poor people in the criminal justice system, particularly around uh, the bail uh, system, um, is uh, the financial incentive that local governments have um, to jail people uh, as they get much more money from uh, the state, depending upon how high uh, their bail uh, rosters are. Mm -hmm. um, and so... One of the things that, you know, I think advocates have tried to, um, to tease out uh, more broadly with the criminal justice system in terms of, obviously, the amount of prisons we've built over the last 40 years, uh, but also on the front end um, of the system as it relates to bail, try to ensure uh, that governments do not have that, that financial incentive. So uh, more money for the state, depending on how many people you have in jail, doesn't seem like the right way in which to handle certain cases as it relates to people coming into the system uh, just on arrest and low level uh, felonies and misdemeanors. Um, and so it's really the, it's really the, the, um, the bail bond industry um, that is of concern, um, billions of dollars that they make every year. Um, and it's a financial incentive that so many localities have uh, to jail people uh, that becomes a, a, a system that essentially feeds on its own um, in a way that um, is incredibly destructive to the ways in which uh, poor people live their lives in America every day. Well, one of the things I thought about, in addition to just being incarcerated while trying to, uh, to wait on a court date, the, what are the long-term effects? What are the long-term effects of people who are being incarcerated for months, sometimes even years, on their mental health, their physical health, emotional health, just being in that environment? I'm just wondering what those. Uh, there have to be some sort of long-term effects of that, particularly when you have not been convicted of a crime. Right. So that's the heart of what we really wanted to show um, in our film. And I think uh, the cases, uh, particularly of William, um, the African-American gentleman from the Bronx, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, who we highlight, and Brianna, uh, the white woman from uh, outside Kansas City, Missouri, I think really highlight that about the, essentially the toll and the uh, potential impact. So um, generally speaking, um, and this is backed by years and years of social, social uh, studies and um, social policy research, um, people who are incarcerated, generally speaking, are more likely to lose their jobs uh, once they um, have been uh, placed in jail because, and, and stay there only because uh, they can't pay their bills. They lose their children to foster care, lose their housing, as I mentioned. Um, and I think it's important um, to realize that 
Sometimes it's only it can only take three or four days, sometimes a week right. for your life to be disrupted when you've been put in jail um, and can't afford your bail. Again, usually on these low level and, and nonviolent offenses. And so um, I think it's important that we're not talking about six months. I mean, but just think about, you know, working class folks who very often don't have lots of different kinds of vacation time, don't have a lot of leeway, yeah. don't have any control at work. You know, so if you miss a week. Um, it's over, you know, the boss has moved on and, and hired and hired somebody else in your place. So that kind of disruption is real. Um, and I think it's important uh, for viewers to understand just how quickly a life can be disrupted um, by a quick stint uh, and, det and detention uh, in a local jail. Um, so there's that. Um, there have been many, many, many studies showing that um, actually because of this disruption, people go out and actually then are more likely to commit crime because their lives have been disrupted. Um, very often when we're talking about people who cannot afford their bails, we're talking about people who already are living on the margins. Mm -hmm. uh, we're always talking about people with very, very little savings. Uh, I'm sure your viewers are familiar with the uh, general understanding in this country that you know most people couldn't pay a $400 doctor bill if they or emergency or would you visit if they had to because there is no savings in their bank accounts. I mean, these are the kinds of lives that many poor people are living. And so, as you can imagine, uh, a detention in jail um, can only do more to further that kind of disruption in their life. Um, and so, and then there's just the long-term effects. So if, for example, um, you've been unable to, you know, to fight your case and you choose um, to uh, take a plea deal, Sometimes you're innocent, sometimes you're guilty, but all very often you want to get out of the situation that you're in. Um, then you've got a, a record. Um, okay. And once you have a record, we know about the disruptive ways in which that has on uh, many people's lives, unable to get employment, unable to live in public housing, um, all the things that come along with the disruption of, of uh, people who are living on the margins are only exacerbated by people who, by situations that are um, uh, induced by uh, the bail, criminal, the criminal cash bail system. It sounds like it really pushes those who are right on the edge, right into poverty. Um, you know, just, and I'm just thinking of how many people live check to check, you know, and a car breaking down a thousand dollars to pay my car would throw somebody off. So I can only imagine, mm -hmm. you know, the increase in poverty rates when you're talking about people who, right. if they are able to make bail because they plead out, they're unable to get jobs now. Right. So how do you take care of your family? Those kinds of things. So right. it, it sounds like it's a, a, a cycle and it's very reminiscent to me of, of payday loans mm -hmm. in our communities and how they kind of trap you into this Absolutely. cycle, you know? I mean, we criminalize poverty in this country you know, to the extent to which, you know, it is, you know, become, as many people I'm sure know, you know, really human rights violations that are going on uh, in our in our nation's jails every every single day. Um, but it, it is this overall when you put everything together between payday loans, as you mentioned, cash bail, um, all these sort of systems that where we criminalize poverty in this country in a way um, that uh, keeps people in these situations and in, in, uh, in a permanent cycles. And, you know, like I've said also, you know, time and time again, you know, one of the ways in which to really address this um, is to just think differently about um, criminal punish the criminal punishment system. I mean, if you think about the over-policing that goes on um, in our black and brown communities, uh, where people are arrested for crimes that they wouldn't be committed if they're living in a white community. Mm -hmm. um, that starts the cycle or that continues the cycle in so many different ways, just starting by who's, who's actually getting arrested. Now, who's actually coming before judges? Mm -hmm. And once you get to a judge, um, then, you know, you have, you know, systems of, um, of uh, inequity where, um, you know, folks who are black and brown, you know, are getting higher bail amounts or more likely to be, you know, be tagged with bail or not let go um, in order to fight their cases. I mean, the, you know, the inequity that goes along with the front end of the system um, is one way in which I think the criminal justice reform movement uh, needs to continue its work. Uh, we've heard a lot about sentencing on the back end. Mm -hmm. We've heard a lot about prison reform, and making prisons less brutal. Uh, but really where it all starts is the front of the system. Who's getting arrested? Who gets bail? How much is that bail? That starts the mass incarceration process as we know it today. Can you speak to, to those who opponents who feel like 
as as our union police union chief said, you know, it's a revolving door of criminals. You know, when you let them out on bail, it puts public safety at risk when you let people out on bail. Can you speak to that argument? Sure. So there are lots of ways to think about this. And, you know, one of the ways that um, I try to talk with folks about that argument um, is the arbitrary way in which we think about the bail system and how it works. So let me just give an example of something that very often or a situation that very often doesn't make uh, the headlines. Um, I'm accused of a crime. Um, I pay my say $1,500 bail, um, judge says, you know what, Mr. Jenkins, um, you know, I, you know, we're going to give you $1,500 bail. This is what our bail schedule says you should pay. This is what the prosecutor has recommended. Um, and, you know, slams down the gavel and I go free and I commit a crime. Let's just say I happen to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, very often there isn't a outcry around that situation, which is me paying my bail, you know, following the rules that have been set, whether they're arbitrary or not. Um, and I go out and by criminal crime, very often that is not um, a, um, a situation that, that the police will show as a, a problem. Of side. However, if I'm someone who um, was not given, it was released on my reconnaissance, um, I was not given a high bail. Let's just say, just say you know, Mr. Jenkins, I trust you. Um, we're going to let you go. Return on your own cognizance, which basically means, you know, leave jail, leave detention without having to pay any money. We want you back here for your court date. If I go out and commit a crime, that situation becomes one in which the judge is actually then criticized. The system is then criticized. Bail reformers are criticized. Mm-hmm. And the only thing that distinguishes those situations is money. Like, so wh- why... Why is that situation that where I was let out on my own recognizance not paying, why is that one of being, no, the fact that I committed a crime is a bad thing, don't get me wrong. Right. Um, but what we're talking about here is the distinctions that we make between who pays and who doesn't. Like mm-hmm. the issue here is money. Like, why is money the thing that somehow should determine whether I'm going to go out and do something again or if I'm going to come back? That's one of the, so, so let's just think about that for a second, that very often when someone who has been let out, out on bail without having paid a bail amount because the judge li- released them on their own recognizance, very often um, that's where the tension becomes when the judge is criticized, the system is criticized, the bail from is criticized because of this arbitrary distinction about money. I just want people just to think about that for a second. Like just because I pay $1,500 doesn't actually make me any more or less dangerous or any more or less not dangerous when I'm out on bail like the fifteen hundred dollars has really very little to do with anything so let's just sort of think about the media uh scrum that comes along Mm -hmm. when we have these situations that we are all distinguishing them on based on this fifteen hundred dollars that i can or can't afford and and so that's just something i like so so i know everybody wants to make a you know a harsh determination on the judge let this person go they want to blame the the jail reform, the, the criminal justice reformers who said, why are you letting these people out on Jimmy? Why, why are you doing these things? And we're all really just talking about a $1,500 amount that really is just an arbitrary amount. So let's just set that aside for a second. But I want folks to think a little bit about why that $1,500 is so important to our conversation in the media about these sort of situations. So that's number one. Number two, um, I would just, um, I think it's very, very, very important um, for the public um, to be skeptical um, of uh, the pushback from police around bail reform and connecting it to higher crime. Um, and I'll take New York as an example. In New York, uh, there was a very robust uh, uh, bail reform effort that passed in the beginning of 2020. Um, and crime did increase uh, a little bit in, the, in New York City in particular. Um, and the police as, and the criminal justice apparatus, as usual, uh, tried to link those two things uh, without doing any kind of research on why there was an increase in crime just be- and, you know, and so- trying to associate that with uh, a new bail reform law that had just been passed. When you really dig into the numbers and really look at the analysis of actually what criminologists do, they found that in most of those cases, 95% of those cases in which people were had committed those crimes, it was, had nothing to do with bail, the bail reform law. Nothing. Mm-hmm. Like the people who had come out of jail, uh, at least on their own recognizance, these were not the people who had committed new crimes. There were some, 
but not the amount, not was not the driver of right. the increase in um, in crime in New York City at that time. So b- before we, you know, allow um, criminal justice um, or the criminal punishment system apparatus to define the, the rules of the debate around some of these issues as it relates to statistics and how, what causes what because of the bail reform laws, we should really take a dig into it, really do the analysis, the rigorous analysis to see whether those individual people um, who actually went out and committed more crimes than was the driver of individual uh, rises and crime in, in various different cities. So I just would, I would implore people who are in ba- engaged in these debates and listen to the debates on television, on the newspaper, Chicago Tribune, other places, um, to really take a look to see whether the, it, A leads to B, that folks who were released actually led to actual new crime. And in most cases, like for example, in New York, the increases in, in, in crime or crime in this country, unfortunately, are around violent crime. Um, the, the majority of cases and crimes that are committed in this country are misdemeanors and low-level felonies. They are not violent crimes. Mm-hmm. And so, um, I th- again, I think we just have to be more rigorous in our understanding as an incumbent upon editorial boards and reporters, uh, anchors, every single part of the media apparatus to ensure that they are not being spun by, you know, the criminal justice apparatus so that they have a clear picture as to whether the one bill form leads to two increasing crime. Now your film is premiering at the uh, film festival this weekend. I have to ask you as a former reporter, what inspired you to even tackle this issue as a documentary? Sure. You know, it's interesting. Um, I covered a lot of things as a reporter. I did cover a little bit of criminal justice, but mainly I was a politics reporter and editor. Um, I knew, you know, a lot about criminal justice, at least I thought, you know, I thought, you know, I was a pretty, um, you know, astute person as it relates to, you know, criminal justice issues. And um, I was sitting on a park bench, um, actually working on another film um, a few years ago, uh, talking to actually of all people, William, William Evans, who's uh, one of the characters in our film um and we were it was march of 2017 it was actually a frigid day in the bronx of all places we we're sitting um in one of the housing projects um in the bronx and uh, he started telling me about what happened to him and if you've, if you've seen the film um you'll know that you know he uh was arrested um on a weapons charge um in 19 uh in, excuse me in 2009 mm-hmm. um and uh this it didn't do it. I mean, he said he didn't do it. Um, he, he pled not guilty, uh, but was thrown into Rikers Island, uh, yeah. given a $3,500 bail and refused to plead out. And so he was in jail for a year fighting his case, uh, had just had a son, um, had uh, just enrolled in college, uh, was working full time, uh, was on the come up, essentially, yeah. you know, yeah. as a young man. And I sat there and I was like, Oh, I get it now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I get it now. Like I, I it never like the bail issue had never so I never put two and two together. In yeah. my head. And I think a lot of people don't really know what the bail system is. Don't really understand what cash bail is. Mainly because what we learn about bail is from Law and Order or NCS exactly. or whatever, whatever. And so that with that conversation got me started on this journey, trying to tell these stories, um, both from a, a park bench perspective, you know, mm-hmm. talking to people about their experience, but also from a social policy and constitutional perspective mm-hmm. um, that essentially the constitution um, prohibits excessive bail. Um, that the 14th amendment prohibits the, the, the detention of people without due process of law. And that if you really think about being jailed for a year, like William was, that's yeah. essentially detention but there has been no yeah. due process yet. And so those kind of constitutional principles, you know, we tried to infuse in the film because we wanted to balance that out with the conversations that we had with William and other people who really put a face on this issue. So that's how I got started. It was really actually embarrassment that I ne- didn't really know what cash bail was and then being incredibly angry about it. So that's how I got started. Yeah. Just lo- watching his tears just was heartbreaking. You see somebody who literally was doing everything right getting ready to go to college about to be a a new parent and to have a a year of your life and everything that comes along with being incarcerated especially at a rikers island um what that does to somebody even now as you profiled him and interviewed him 
those emotions were so raw. So you really put a, a, a human face on, on this. And I, I really applaud what you did. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd like to ask you what to you, what does bail reform look like to you? It's what would make question. it more equitable? Great, great question. It's actually not as easy as it sounds. Um, back to a little bit to the conversation we had about money. Um, but for starters, um, bail reform really just means to me what the, what the Eighth Amendment says. You know, you know, excessive bail is prohibited. That you cannot, you know, charge someone or place uh, unaffordable bail on someone's circumstances. So, I think a lot of criminal justice reformers would say. You know what? If a judge asked a person who had been accused of a crime, you know, how much bail can you afford? Uh, and they said, I can afford fifty dollars. Then that should be your bail. Um, mm-hmm. Having you know five hundred dollars for someone who can afford fifty dollars is essentially five million dollars. Like you don't have it, you don't have it. So no one's saying necessarily that there shouldn't be some degree of money involved in ensuring that you come back to jail and that you get that money after you complete your case. So, you know, in Ohio right now, actually, one of the the states that you wouldn't think would be going through a a criminal justice reform piece, um, they are setting bails for everybody, whether you're wealthy or not, at 25% of the median income. Right. And so if you are, you know, if you are Harvey Weinstein <laughs> and you have two million, you know, your bail is going to be set at the same percentage amount as, um, you know, Chris Jenkins, who's got no money in the bank. Right. right? And and so and so that's, that's so so that's equity to some degree. Right. Is at least saying everybody's paying the same amount and that money is out of this now. Like if you've been in charge with, you know, you've been, you know, arrested and charged, you know, and, you know, you've got two hundred dollars, you know, two hundred dollars to your name, you know, X, the X percent, you know, is what your bail is going to be uh, going forward, just like it would be if I had two million dollars in the bank. So that's for starters, number one. Um, number two, I think, you know, as with all things criminal justice, as we talked about earlier, everything is connected. Yeah. There or another. Um, the reason why there are so many black and brown men, you know, who are going in front of judges because they're arrested at higher rates, because we saw with stop and frisk um, in New York, you know, all those, you know, you know, those interactions between cops and, you know, people on the street, generally speaking, were between black and brown men. So, okay. you know, we, we, you know, so cash bill is one thing, but it's also connected to arrest rates and who's arrested. And once we, you know, deal with issues of um, getting in front of judges, you know, we have to make sure that there's equity to make sure that black and brown men aren't given higher jail, ha- higher um, bail amounts or aren't more likely to get bail uh, placed on them more so than white men or white women who are accused of the same crimes. Mm. So that's one another way of dealing with cash bail reform or reform in general is to take out the bias, you know, take out the prejudice that is endemic in our system uh, that we've seen for, you know, for decades, if not hundreds of years. Yeah. So, um, but the one thing I'd like to uh, make sure that your viewers um, sort of think about is that, and we mentioned this briefly in the film, is that the criminal punishment system um, is really in, in business um, and is exists in order to reestablish its financial security at every single point. So one of the things that uh, is coming up as alternatives to cash bail is to, when someone is arrested and they are allowed to, say, go free on their own recognizance, uh, what we call release on recognizance, um, very often there are now systems where people have to pay for their own ankle bracelets um, in order to be tracked so that they come back to court. And that's just another way of charging people for um, uh, their alleged crime before they've even been convicted. convicted. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I, you know, so these are things that we just have to be, we have to be careful about the ways in which we are moving forward um, because there are lots of systems in place that are not actually all that helpful. Um, one of the things that is going around the country um, are risk assessments. Risk assessments essentially um, are tools that prosecutors and judge can use in order to decide who is dangerous and can be let out of jail before they come back uh, for their court case. And these are essentially done by computers. They're al- algorithms that decide 
Um, all right, this person, Chris Jenkins, has uh, committed two crimes before. He's been arrested two times before. So this person thereby must be you know, held in jail uh, because, and this is a, a computer program that's doing this now. So his risk right. assessment is at a certain level. Well, of course, I'm going to be, you know, seen as more dangerous or potentially a flight risk uh, than somebody else because I've been arrested a couple of times. But this gets back to what I said earlier about, well, if you live in a neighborhood where you're more likely to be arrested just because of, of either what you look like or your yeah. behavior, then the information that goes into the risk assessment is already tainted. Already biased. Um, and so, I mean, so, so the unwinding the system um, yeah. is really, really difficult. And we're a really, really, really important um, portion of the cash bail debate and criminal justice reform debate, uh, because at every turn, um, there are financial interests that are um, involved in the conversations in a way that help keep them profitable. Mm. Um, and I just, you know, it's just important for people to um, just understand what's going on behind the scenes when we hear about what criminal justice reform really means. Yeah. And so I think there are lots of different ways to go as it relates to cash bail in terms of making a much more equitable system for people who have been arrested um, and come before a judge. Uh, but those are two ways that I'd like people to think a little bit about sort of what uh, we're all up against as we think about what reform really means. But let's just focus our attention, I think, on really where most crime is committed. They're usually property crimes. They're usually crimes of poverty. They're usually um, low-level uh, felonies, misdemeanors. I mean, essentially, that's when we need to start doing a lot of the work. How do we deal with not only folks who put them, who are find themselves in situations like that, but how do we alleviate circumstances for folks so that they can live more healthy and make better choices for themselves as it relates to their entire lives? You know, all this stuff is connected uh, to why people uh, find themselves on the margins. Um, and, you know, those are the deeper conversations we need to have um, in the society about how we, you know, get our way out of this criminal punishment system so that people aren't even find themselves needing to commit crimes in the first place. Thank you so much Thank you. for speaking with us today. I really, yeah, really thanks so much it. for having me. Really enjoy the conversation. Thank you. Me too. Take okay. care. Take care now. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. With cash bail, whenever you have a system predicated on having to pay money in order to secure liberty, you are going to disadvantage black and brown populations. 76% of the people that are being held in our local state jails across this country are being held there before they have been convicted of a crime. I had to stay in because I could not afford my $7,500 bail. To be taken away from my newborn for the 11 months and four days, it did a lot to me. We have to be honest about this. We've used the criminal justice system to rake money. They have a financial incentive to keep more people in for longer. Over the past 20 years, 100% of jail growth has been the result of the American cash bail system that holds people in jail cells who haven't been convicted of a crime because they don't have enough money to pay. It's unbelievable. We're in a moment right now where there are black mothers sitting in cages that need uh, their voices heard. And so our goal is to ultimately end pre-child detention. Brianna was charged with possessing someone else's driver's license. So she's been sitting for months because her family can't scrape together $500. My bail was $50,000. My daughters, they've never been without me for this amount of time. On any given night in America, there are half a million people that go to sleep in jail cells because they cannot pay their bail. And it is why it's really become a human rights crisis in this country. It's not just a policy fight. It's a hearts and minds fight. presented by Trinity United Church of Christ and the next movement, 
the 7th annual Injustice for All Film Festival will screen feature-length documentaries, feature films, and shorts, all with themes centered on the epidemic of mass incarceration, the criminal justice system, racism and white supremacy, gun violence, police brutality, and more. For more information, visit the ChicagoDefender.com.